I want to talk about a wonderfully exciting piece of software. In fact, of all the apps on all the systems, this is my favorite type of program, the web browser. You likely know what a web browser is, but you might not have considered all the things that make it so fantastic, especially for artists. If you're watching this video, there's a good chance you're interested and you already have a web browser and you know how to find content you want on the internet, but you might not realize that the browser is also a blank canvas for artists. Actually, less like a blank canvas and more like an art studio, fully stocked with all sorts of art tools like an interactive and generative 2D drawing canvas, also a 3D drawing context, also an audio sampling and synthesis playground, MIDI, speech I synthesis, love the internet so much. photography, Bluetooth, it's got all of the things. And actually, it's more than just a fully stocked net art studio because the browser is also a gallery, a gallery where you can explore net art and quite frankly, all manner of interesting contemporary cultural activities, but also a gallery where you can share your work with anyone who's got access to the internet, which these days is about 40% of the planet and that's growing. And you can edit or add to that work at any time and folks will have access to it instantly. That work can be interactive or generative. It could change and grow and branch forever. So how could we use browsers to make art? What should we make with them? Why should we use them this way? These are kind of big questions, but the answers lie partly in the ideas that led to its conception and invention. The internet is amazing, and it's changing every day. In order to understand why the web browser is the internet's gift to artists, by which I mean in order for us to really take advantage of what it's got to offer us, we need to understand where browsers came from and the deeply interwingled ideas of all the radical thinkers who influenced it. First, let's put the web part aside for a minute and talk about this word, browser. Browsing could sound like a consumer thing, like, can I help you, sir? No, I'm just browsing. But think about it in terms of your art practice, in terms of curiosity, exploration, research. That's actually why it's called the browser. By the late 1970s and early 80s, computers got small enough and relatively inexpensive enough that a middle class person in the States could actually own one at home. Most people didn't though, because they had no idea what they would do with them. Computers were things for engineers, scientists, and nerds. In those days, personal computers didn't have graphics. It was just text on a screen. Sitting down in front of a computer meant staring at a blinking cursor. If you wanted to do something on these terminals, you had to know exactly what you wanted to do. You needed to know what commands were hidden inside that computer and what they were for. You needed a plan and you needed to know how to execute that plan. Meanwhile, a team of some of my favorite computer people of all time, known as the Learning Research Group, formed at Xerox Park. Alan Kay, Adele Goldberg, Dan Ingalls, and others envisioned a world where computers would be very personal machines that you could carry around in your book bag. These Dynabooks, as they called them, wouldn't be your typical terminal. It would be a dynamic medium for creating creative thought. It would be graphical. You'd use a mouse. You didn't have to know how to program or even what you wanted to do with the computer because the system itself would be a place to learn and explore. Inspired by the experimental systems of earlier computer graphics pioneers like Ivan Sutherland's Sketchpad and Doug Engelbart's NLS system, the Xerox PARC folks didn't just write about these ideas, they actually produced that system and called it Smalltalk one of the first object-oriented programming languages and the first real graphical user interface. In terms of techniques for accessing information, a key presentational technique we've used is to divide up the display screen into rectangular areas or parts that people like to call windows. And so they're windows onto information. The primary kind of window that we like to talk about is one that we call a browser. We do this because too often we think of computers as being very precise machines in which you have to precisely say, I want this or that, and you get it back, exactly what you asked for. But the nice quality of a library is that you can walk around looking for something specific, but as you're doing it, you find other things. And that's what browsing is all about. The browser was a curiosity-driven interface. Multiple windows, copy-paste, small incremental changes. These are all commonplace now, but it wasn't how people used computers back then. One day, though she warned her superiors that it would be a bad idea, Adele Goldberg was forced to share all the details about their new system with a now infamous visitor to Xerox Park, Steve Jobs, who would later quickly borrow many of their new concepts, as would Bill Gates, to make the first commercially available home computers with graphical user interfaces. They, of course, only borrowed all the ideas which would help them brand the computer as a friendly, 
sort of household appliance for consumers, but they would leave out some of the most important ideas, like the fact that the graphical user interface wasn't meant to obfuscate code, to hide it from the user like, like it was used in, in Windows and Mac. It was meant to augment the code, to help you program. Smalltalk was first and foremost a creative coding environment. Apple and Windows would also lose sight of the new metamedia concept. Instead, they would generally imitate old media. Movies, music, and books would eventually just become MOVs, MP3s, and PDFs on the computer. Not all that different from their analog counterparts. In contrast, for Kay and Goldberg, the computer was a new active medium, which could respond to queries and experiments, so that the message may involve the learner in a two-way conversation. This property has never been available before except through the medium of an individual teacher. We think the implications are vast and compelling. A new kind of medium would have been created, a meta-medium, whose content would be a wide range of already existing and not yet invented media. I think it could be argued, though it's often not, that the browser started with Alan Kay, Adele Goldberg, and the others at Xerox Park. But I would be remiss not to mention one of the web browser's biggest influences, arguably one of the most radical computer thinkers of all time, right up there with Ada Lovelace, Ted Nelson. In college, Nelson, who was making experimental films at the time, discovered computers and immediately realized the vast implications Kay and Goldberg would describe a decade later. While Smalltalk was being developed, Nelson was working on another piece of software called Xanadu, a program so novel it introduced a whole set of new ideas into the computer world, most notably hypertext. These days, when we hear hypertext, we probably immediately think of the internet, but these weren't as related at the time. Nelson was developing his hypertext idea in the 60s. Remember, that's the same time the ARPA folks were starting to develop the internet. Internet. From a certain conceptual vector view, Xanadu actually had more in common with Smalltalk than the ARPANET. Nelson's hypertext or hypermedia idea was about the computer as a space for what he referred to as a generalized media format, which was a lot like Kay and Goldberg's metamedia. Xanadu wasn't a programming environment like Smalltalk, but like Smalltalk, it was about framing the computer as a tool for augmenting our thinking, as a friendly space for discovery, where the user was both a reader and a writer, rather than simply a consumer of a new high-tech household appliance. Influenced by earlier thinkers, most notably Vannevar Bush, Ted Nelson's Xanadu, like Smalltalk, was a system for exploring. Before the web, we generally organized information sequentially. We put things into categories, indexed them numerically and alphabetically. Xanadu wouldn't be a collection of discrete books indexed in a card catalog. It would be a mashup of all human knowledge. You could be reading an article which had embedded in it, or more accurately, transcluded into it, another piece of media which you could click on and follow back to its original source, which itself would have another piece of media you could click on and follow back to its original source. With each click, you'd make an associative jump to another piece of content. Navigating Xanadu had more in common with the way we may think, jumping from thought to associated thought, than the way we might typically organize information, again, into discrete categories like action versus comedy, movies versus music. If you haven't seen this already, you should definitely watch Ted Nelson's 2007 demo of Xanadu. Keep in mind that he was developing and pitching these ideas in the 1960s way ahead of his time. It took a while for folks to understand Nelson's vision, but by the late 80s, there was a small hypermedia scene. Artists and computer scientists were making hypermedia work and software. There were small conferences. And in 1990, Douglas Adams, author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, even made a 15 minute documentary on it called Hyperland, which you gotta watch if you haven't seen it. It's amazing. But none of these folks are really thinking about hypermedia in relation to the internet. Hypermedia is interactive, nonlinear, multimedia experiences, while the internet at the time looked like this. If you were relatively computer savvy, you could use it. You might download files from a remote computer. You might send an email message to your friend on their computer, but it wasn't a very hyper space. But when Hyperland was released in 1990, all the pieces were there for something like the web to actually happen. The internet was solid and there was lots of hypermedia projects. Someone just had to bring these two niche worlds together. And that's where Tim Berners-Lee enters the picture. With help from his collaborators, Robert Caliu and Nicola Pello, who's oddly missing from the Wikipedia page, I might have to fix that before this video goes up. Tim Berners-Lee realized that if you took hypertext and connected it to the internet, both of these things were going to blow up. Like all great ideas, he had a hard time conveying folks about it. His bosses at CERN didn't quite get why. The folks at the Internet Engineering Task Force weren't really feeling it. And even all the creative hypermedia folks initially brushed off the idea. Tim Berners-Lee was practically giving the idea away, trying to get hypermedia folks to just add the internet, add some TCP IP to their hypermedia software, but they all passed them up on it. So Tim, Robert, and Nicola just did it themselves. Together in and around 1990, they invented the World Wide Web. 
Tim Berners-Lee created a protocol which would bring hypermedia documents to the Internet, HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol. He also defined a format for structuring these hypertext documents called HTML, Hypertext Markup Language, a simple metamedia document structure that could be text, images, later video and audio, and all forms of interactive media all at the same time, as in all this stuff in the same type of file. And lastly, he created an addressing scheme for finding these HTML documents online, which he describes as the most fundamental innovation of the web, the URI or URL. Sort of the same thing, but not, but I'm not, you know, just, yeah. And so that's the web. The web isn't a collection of websites necessarily, nor any particular browser or server. The web is how you make a hypermedia doc, HTML, how you find them online, URIs or URLs, and how you can get those docs over the internet, HTTP. It's less a specific thing and more a way of doing things. Quote, what was often difficult for people to understand about the design was that there was nothing else beyond URIs, HTTP, and HTML. There was no central computer controlling the web, no single network on which these protocols worked, nor even an organization anywhere that ran the web. The web was not a physical thing that existed in a certain place. It was a space in which information could exist. And Berners-Lee took special care to design it in such a way as to allow for the widest degree of participation possible. This meant standardizing the technical rules, but making these rules acceptable to everyone, which meant as close to no rules as possible. This also meant making it public domain with, quote, no strings attached, so anyone could participate in any way they wanted. This also meant making it completely decentralized, an idea he got from the internet. That would be the only way a new person somewhere could start to use it without asking for access from anyone else, and that would be the only way that the system could scale so that as more people used it, it wouldn't get bogged down. And lastly, this meant it had to be easy to install it, to view web pages, and to edit web pages. A few years later, in 1994, he would start the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, open to anyone around the world at any company, university, public interest group, government agency, etc., that's interested in developing the web. The W3C is where all these ideas that make the web what it is are defined. So that's all web-related standards, like HTTP, HTML, CSS, which all the browsers today are implementations of. Which again reminds me of this point. The web isn't so much a physical thing, like the internet, which is a physical thing. It's more a way of doing things, a conceptual space where information and your art can exist. So of course, this would be nothing more than a great idea if you didn't have at least one web page to look at and at least one browser to look at it on. So Tim, Robert, and Nicola got it started themselves. They made the first web pages and the first browsers, and they actually made a few different browsers together and independently, starting with the first web browser called the World Wide Web. Tim Berners-Lee quickly realized that the World Wide Web was a much bigger thing than any single browser, so he renamed that first browser Nexus. Browsers today are way more advanced than this first one that Tim Berners-Lee released in 1990, but these updates haven't all been improvements. The first web browser, like the Smalltalk browser at Xerox Park, was, as media archaeologist Jim Bolton explains, a browser editor. Not only could people view websites from that browser, they could also create them. It's only subsequent browsers that have made the distinction between the creators of websites and the consumers of websites. Tim Berners-Lee's and Robert Kayar's original vision was a vision for a truly collaborative space. Still, the web browser evolved in a more consumer direction, like most everything else graphical user interface related. In some browsers, this capability is actually still there and should be brought to the fore. The browser has changed a lot over the years, but it still has all the creative potential that Adele Goldberg emphasized in that interview decades ago, and like I demonstrated in the beginning of this video. Now, these editing capabilities are mainly there for web developers. When we want to browse the web, we type a URL into the address bar and hit enter. This is how we tell our browser to make an HTTP request for a file, usually an HTML document, stored on a particular server at the location described by the URL. When we do this, the file is copied from the server's hard drive, transferred over the internet to our computer, and the copy is pasted onto our hard drive. We experience these HTML files as web pages on the web browser, but when these pages don't quite render right, web developers use browser tools to view, edit, and in the case of some browsers like Firefox, even save a new version of that file. So while most folks simply surf the web on their browsers, web developers scuba dive deep down into the source code using these developer tools. By now, I'm hoping you realize all of the creative potential, both technically and conceptually, embedded in our browsers. But you might feel a bit weary to take this deep dive into the developer tools, which makes sense. These developer tools can be intimidating for beginners because they're not designed for beginners. They're designed for web developers. Unlike the editing functionality of Tim Berners-Lee's original browser editor vision, as well as Adele Goldberg and Alan Kay's browser, which were very much designed for beginners. This is why I've made the Web Snorkeler, which is a Firefox plugin you can install on your browser, which is less of a web console deep dive and more of a 
sort of dip just beneath the surface into the source code. I'll be using the web snorkeler throughout the beginning of this series before eventually transitioning over into the more advanced developer console. Once you have it installed, you can use the web snorkeler to sort of explore any website, but this plugin is specifically for the next set of tutorials. In fact, parts of the tutorials will take place in the actual plugin. So where I can talk to you as you code, but also where I can code along with you, and I can stop to let you know when you've made a mistake. Like that one right right there. We should, we should probably fix that. There we go. So if you're interested in making some internet art, and if you made it this far in the video, I would hope that you are, make sure to download that plugin before the next video. If you like where this video series is going, make sure that you like and subscribe. I've also got links to sources for all the stuff that I've been making claims about down below in the description. Also down below is the comment section. Make sure that you share your thoughts, comments, ideas, so that we can all chat about the web, because if it wasn't obvious already, I love to chat about the web.